embarking on a rather strange topic tonight. We're going to talk about UFOs. Now, this is an area that uh, most people tend to relegate to the demented or incompetent or fringe type people. And yet, uh, the entertainment industry, of course, has uh, picked up on this with the uh, uh, a crop circle thing called Signs, which may, many of uh, you may have seen. And also, uh, Steven Spielberg did a mini series called Taken, focusing on the abductions and so forth. And uh, while these things are interesting entertainment, they are replete, of course, with all kinds of misinformation and, and uh, legends and uh, half-truths that get mingled with facts so that it's uh, really just entertainment. But one of the things you and I have to face is, uh, what is the real reality here? Is this just a bunch of nonsense, a, a composite of hoaxes and, and pranks by various people through the years? Or is there something really going on? One of the things we want to explore a little tonight is, are the UFOs real? And if so, where are they from? What's their agenda? Are they friendly or hostile? And uh, more, most important, what does the Bible say about them? So we're going to explore that tonight as we go forth on our exp exploration of UFOs and the strange term, the Nephilim. Uh, what is that all about? But before we start, since we are dealing with a very, very complicated area, an area where many of us have already formed opinions, let me remind you of the, there's a principle. According to Edmund Spencer, he, he articulated this, there's a principle which is a bar against all information. It's proof against all argument. And it's something which cannot fail to keep man in everlasting ignorance. And that principle is condemnation before investigation. So one of our challenges as we go into this very complicated topic is to set aside our prejudices and presuppositions and let's see what we can uh, find out. Now, the same idea is not only uh, articulated by Edmund Spencer, but it also is in our uh, uh, collection of Proverbs by Solomon, who reminds us that he that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. So one of our challenges tonight is sort of set aside what we think we may have heard or what, we, what our basic prejudices are, and let's see what we can find out that might be new. Now, many of us, of course, have seen photographs, many of which are hoaxes, contrived, and so forth. Uh, there are many of these in the literature. I'm sure you've seen all kinds. Uh, the problem is, is that not all of them are. It may surprise you to learn that there are over 3,000 authenticated photographs in the classified community that are uh, authenticated. So what's really going on here? See, the, the problem we have in researching this area is there is so much that's uncorroborated, there's a lot of deliberate disinformation, and certainly a lot of data which is unreliable. And uh, the problem is, when you strip away the hoaxes and you strip away the nonsense and you set aside the uncorroborated, there still is too much to ignore that is substantiated that involves multiple reliable witnesses, including multiple radar sightings. And uh, radars generally don't have hallucinations. And uh, this idea of being plotted simultaneously on multiple radars is something that should get our attention. And uh, now, I'll give you one example. Back in, on June 18th of 1997, there was a strange vehicle that appeared over Phoenix, Arizona. In fact, went over most of the state at about 30 miles an hour, which is very slow for an airborne vehicle. There were some that said they felt they could have hit it with a, a, a ball that seemed that close as it went over. And it created quite a stir. And um, on March 13th, there were, there were uh, uh, sightings uh, all the way uh, from Casa Grande and Chandler, all the way up through uh, the northern part of the state, Prescott and so forth. So there was a, it wasn't just a local phenomenon, and uh, it created quite a stir. Now, the governor of Arizona made a big mistake by treating a press conference the following morning lightly as humor. And it didn't go over very well because people were upset because they were getting stonewalled by the government. Uh, even though there were denials by the Air Force, they saw the fighter jets uh, 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 sorry after them and so on, so it, it created quite a stir. It wasn't picked up in the national media 
It was picked up, of course, substantially in the local media, that is, in the state of Arizona. And uh, one of the things that's strange about this is that it happened in March of, of, uh, uh, of uh, 1997. It didn't show up until June 18th. And for, what's, what's strange to me is not just the event that happened in March, but there was no word about it in the national media. But then for some reason, some, no obvious reason, on uh, June 18th, it was on the front page of USA Today. That's where this picture came from. It was on the, uh, NBC, CBS, CNN, all the major networks had this brief comment about what happened. What was puzzling about it, it didn't happen on June 18th. It happened back in March. And I haven't been able to determine what triggered the news media to make it a big event at that time. It's one thing it does demonstrate is how the news is managed, because all the networks pick it up at the same time uh, for no ostensible reason. Um, but as we talk about these kinds of things, sooner or later, we have to focus on the Roswell incident. And uh, many of you realize that approximately July 4th, a few days following maybe, some object, that's in 1947, some object landed near Roswell, New Mexico. And uh, Sheriff George Wilcox contacted the Roswell Army Airfield um, regarding wreckage that was discovered on Max Brazel's ranch or in, in that area. The Army seals off the area and confiscates everything that was there. And uh, on, on the 8th of July, uh, Colonel William Blanchard, who was commander of the 509th Bomb Group, that was our primary atomic bomb group in those days, uh, he issued an official press release stating that the wreckage of a crashed disk had been recovered. Now this press release went out early enough on July 8th to be picked up by 30 newspapers across the country. And so it is. And this is a, a, a snapshot of uh, what it looks like. The RAAF uh, captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region and so forth. And no details of flying disc are revealed, etc., etc. Except within hours, something very strange happens. A second press release, which it tried to rescind the first one, was issued from the office of Brigadier General Roger Ramey, who was commander of the 8th Air Force. At, and it, uh, he resides at Fort Worth uh, Army Airfield in Texas, which is about 400 miles away from the incident. But within hours, General Ramey issues a countermanding release, and he claimed that Colonel Blanchard and the officers of the 509th uh, at Roswell had made an unbelievably foolish mistake that somehow they incorrectly identified a weather balloon and its radar reflector as the wreckage of a crashed disk. Now, frankly, everyone that heard this, that thought about it a little bit, realized that was just a very uh, uh, contrived cover story. And uh, uh, it, he, this press release that, in effect, hit the next day by General Ramey uh, caused, you know, it was in effect a denial, uh, did not explain why they confiscated everything, why the whole subject has been classified to this day. And uh, now, that, what that really did, this absurd cover story, frankly, just fueled the uh, 50 years, the intervening 50 years of conjectures and all kinds of anecdotal testimonies of people who were involved peripherally. All kinds of stories have been echoing uh, uh, throughout the, the, uh, this half century that's transpired since uh, July of 1947. And the stories typically maintain that there were four alien occupants of this uh, 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 disk, that for three of them were dead, one was still alive, all these presumably were taken off to the, uh, uh, the never never land of military security and there's all kinds of stories that are too preposterous to really accept and yet uh, it continues. The great mystery about, uh, uh, well, every, when I travel, one of the most often questions I get is what really happened at Roswell? Well, we don't really know what happened at Roswell. It's been classified, and we'll talk about that a little bit. We do know something that happened nine months after the Roswell incident. Al Gore was born. <laughs> and, <laughs> And it turns out he really was. The, the Roswell incident occurred uh, nominally about July, uh, days following July 4th in 1947.